as a research scientist, think about how little time you spend presenting against how much time you spend working in the lab or on your computations. You might give one presentation at a conference for 20 minutes, or you might give a colloquium at your institution for 50 minutes. Question comes, how do you make that time as a effective as possible to represent all the work that you've done. This film focuses on that question. And in particular, this film pays a lot of attention to the slides that you create for that presentation. Now, you might ask why. And one thing that I have found in my 30 years of researching scientific presentations is that slides make more of a difference for the success and I would say more often the downfall of scientific presentations than people realize. First, when you're creating slides, you make important decisions. What information you're going to include and equally important, what information you're going to leave out. And of that information that you include, you also make decisions. What am I going to emphasize, perhaps by putting on the slide? And what am I going to de-emphasize by folding into your speech? A second way that slides affect a presentation success occurs in the delivery. Sadly, many presenters use PowerPoint's defaults and spend so much of their delivery turning, reading, or paraphrasing a bullet on the slide, turning back to the audience, then turning, reading, or paraphrasing, then turning back. And that rhythm, what a lot of people call a death by PowerPoint rhythm, pulls down a presentation. The best presenters, however, they speak from what they know and their visual aids are, in fact, aids for the audience rather than notes for them. Yet a third way that slides affect a presentation success occurs with how much the audience understands from them. Our research has found that challenging PowerPoint's defaults and using a different approach, such as what you're going to learn in this film, actually increases the amount of comprehension by the audience in a statistically significant way. So, I've had a number of people who have used this approach. The woman in the upper left, Katie Kirsch, while she was getting her PhD, she used this approach in all her conference presentations and she won best presentation at the conference three times. Gentleman at the bottom, Professor Ari Magnus Bruisset from Simula Research Laboratory and University of Oslo in Norway. He uses this approach and his colleagues use this approach in all their presentations that they make to industry to present their research. And the woman scientist in the upper right, Dar Dr. Barbara Beacons from the U.S. Geological Survey, she had to give a lecture to 40 different places across the country. And she decided to use this approach for that lecture because so many people were going to see her work presented in that fashion. We've had research groups use the assertion evidence approach. And what you see here on the screen is a large gas turbine research group at Penn State. We've had courses adopt the approach. And here you see a large design course at Penn State. And, and, this, and the approach was used by both the professors who taught the class and by the students who reported on their designs. We've even had one national organization, the Engineering Ambassadors Network, adopt the approach for all the presentations that they use in high school to recruit STEM students. 
Now, one assumption that I'm going to make in this presentation is that the goals for your research presentation are that they are understood, that your presentations are remembered, and that your presentations are believed. I'm also going to have another assumption that on a personal level, you have a goal of wanting to feel and project more confidence. So where do we start? Where I would like to start is, is I would like you to think about when you watch scientific presentations and you see the slides, what are the biggest problems that you see with those slides? I've asked this question to hundreds of scientists and engineers around the world. And the number one answer, and it's not even close, is too many words. And no doubt, you see many examples of that weekly in presentations that are given at conferences, in seminars, in classrooms that, are, that include slides. And, you, and, and that particular problem is not one that actually is so surprising. In the mid-1980s, some research came out, and that research points to why having too many words is a problem. So let's say you have a speaker and you have an audience. Now, we've known forever that the speaker's spoken words, those are going to be taken in through the ears. And if the speaker has any written words, those are going to be taken in through the eyes. But it wasn't until the mid-1980s that a Canadian psychology researcher by the name of Alan Pivio found that those written words and spoken words are processed in the same part of the brain. And another researcher, this one from Australia, John Sweller, he thought about Pivio's research and he asked this question. If written words and spoken words are processed in the same part of the brain, could that part of the brain become overloaded, much as a central processing unit can become overloaded when it tries to do too many tasks? And so Sweller he did experiments. He had one room where people just read, one room where people just listened, and another room where people read and listened. And when there weren't too many words in the comprehension tests that he gave after those presentations, the room where they read and listened, they did the best. But what he found is, is that there were too many words projected. That what happened is, is that room that was both reading and listening went from first to worst. And so Sweller came up with this theory that if audiences try to process too many words, this cognitive overload occurs. And that is what happens in many presentations. Now, scientists and engineers will also talk about a couple of other problems. I mean, they'll actually talk about a lot of problems, but, but there are three that stand out. So too many words is number one. A second one is that the slides are cluttered. And, and by cluttered, they mean that the, that the audience isn't sure where to look. And so you have a slide, and maybe what you want to do is you want to look at a graph on the slide, because you think the graph contains the most important things. But there's text and arrows and other things that are impinging on that, that graph, and your eye gets pulled away. A third problem is, is that many people find that much of the text on slides is not readable. And you can see in this graph that even though maybe you can see the curves, what you cannot read are the axes. And if you can't read the axis of a, axes of a, of a graph, then the value of that graph plummets. A big takeaway is that because so many people, something like 95%, use PowerPoint, that then PowerPoint's defaults become important. 
And what we realize is, is PowerPoint came out about the same time that Pivia was coming out with his research. And the two gentlemen who created that program, Robert Gaskins, who was an entrepreneur, and Dennis Austin, who was a computer scientist, they were not aware of Pyveo's research. Now, they ended up, I think, doing the best they could with the computer architecture of the day. But a problem is, is that the defaults were not based on any research. Worse yet, and maybe the big tragedy is, is that PowerPoint's defaults have not changed significantly. Yeah, in 2003, they changed from Times New Roman to Arial. And in 2007, they changed from Arial typeface to Calibri. And they threw in Microsoft's little, uh, little artistic uh, insert. But, but nothing actually changed here. So one thing that I want you to realize is is that PowerPoint's defaults run counter to how people learn. That text box in the body that has all those nested bullets, that leads people to create too many written words. As John Sweller says, it is a disaster how many words people will put on slides. That text box also consumes valuable space that could be used for images which makes the slides cluttered. And then one last thing, and something that I've been paying a lot of attention to, is that that headline leads scientists and engineers to write phrase headlines that on the surface, that sounds like a good idea, but a problem is that a phrase headline does not filter noise. And as you could remember from when we first talked about why slides are important, it's important for us to have a filter on what to include and what not to include. I'm going to give you one quotation because we can do better. I'm going to give you one quotation. And I could have chosen a lot, but I'm going to choose this one. The real mystery to me is why PowerPoint's default style has been adopted so widely. Why do medical researchers use the PowerPoint style at academic conferences? Why do engineers use the PowerPoint style for technical discussions? And the reason I like this quotation as a criticism of PowerPoint is that it was done by none other than Robert Gaskins, the creator of PowerPoint. I mean, if Gaskins himself challenges the defaults, then you should as well. So the question comes, what should we do? But before we do that, I have yet another assumption I want you to have, and that is you should not have slides if slides do not support the presentation. In other words, if, sl if, if slides do not help the audience understand, remember, or believe the content. And someone who was very astute at that particular point and did not include slides if they weren't needed was Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs thought about his presentations in a sense as a story. And in each slide or blank screen, that was a scene. And so if you don't need a slide, press the B on the control panel of your, of your computer or use your advancer to blank the screen, or better yet, insert a black slide so that then the audience knows to focus on you. And while that focus might seem frightening at first, that fo focus is important because, as Faraday said, for your presentation to be a success, the audience has to believe in you. You have to show ownership of the information. Now, maybe you won't have a blank screen at a conference presentation because those are so compressed. But in a symposium, this 50 minutes, think about having at least one scene where there is no slide and you move to a part of the room where no one typically stands. That will command attention. Okay, now we're ready. So then what should we do? And my first piece of advice to you is 
build your talk on messages, not on topics. Most scientists and engineers in research build their presentations on topics, introductions, methods, results, discussion. You can do better than that. So what often happens is, is let's say you're putting together a presentation and you're at a particular scene and you decide, hmm, Electron acceptors, that's what I'm going to be talking about here. And so you write electron acceptors in your biggest typeface up at the top. And then you write down all the things you want to say. You write those down below. And then if, and you put those in this bulleted list. And then if there's any room, then you include an image. What I'm telling you here is, is go back to step one and stop there. You can do better. Build your talk on messages. And so Dr. Barbara Beacons, when she was putting together her presentation on the effect of hydrology on the 25-year degradation of a crude oil spill, on this particular scene, she thought deeply about what she wanted the audience to walk out the door with. And then she wrote this sentence. A succession of electron acceptors occurs when an aquifer becomes contaminated with oil. And then she took that sentence, tightened it as much as she could, and put that at the top of a slide. And once she had that, then she had a filter. And then she created visual evidence to support that. And so when you've got an oil spill, that occurs in an aerobic aquifer, what depletes first is the oxygen. And so what you see here is, is that this oxygen, this becomes depleted in this outer band of the plume. And once that is depleted, then you get these bands of other types of depletions you get a reduction of nitrate and manganese, and then you get a reduction of iron, and then there's a reduction of sulfate. So what she has done is, is she has stated her assertion up at the top and then supported that assertion visually. That's principle number one. Principle number two is to support your messages with visual evidence, not bullet list. Could be photographs, drawings, diagrams, graphs. Could be an equation, could be a film, could be a short table. And then what you are to do is, is by creating that, you allow the audience to focus on the visual evidence, and then what it is you're saying. You avoid that cognitive overload. So let's go back to PyVO. And if you remember, PyVO found that written words and spoken words, they're processed in the same part of the brain. But his research also found that images are processed in a different part of the brain. And another researcher, Professor Richard Mayer from UC Santa Barbara, what he did is he really ran with the question on what is the effect of using images in a presentation? What is the effect on the learning that the audience has? And so he's done a number of experiments. And his big takeaway is, is that people learn much more deeply from words and relevant images than from words alone. So let's take a look at an example. I'm going to choose a PhD graduate student, Jacob Snyder, who's presenting a scene from one of his conference presentations and from his PhD defense. And so in this scene, he's talking about the effect of using additive manufacturing or 3D printing on some really small channels. And so he begins the scene by showing a channel 
that is built in the vertical direction, much as a smokestack. And what you can see is, and what he points out, is the variation that occurs in that 3D printed channel. And then once he has set that up, then what he does is, is he shows a channel that was built as a pipeline. And what you see is, is that there's much more variation in that particular channel, that parts of it actually almost cave in. And so you might think, oh, well, it's obvious we would go with the vertical one, except that these channels, they are served to produce heat transfer of these very hot gases. And so as it turns out, having that roughness can be an asset. And then he went on to show another channel, this one at 45 degrees, and he made the point that manufacturers could choose different angles to balance having the overall shape that they want with increased roughness. Now, we've looked at an assertion evidence slide here. Let's take it apart. And, and the slide began with the assertion headline. Now, some of you might say, you know, I, I bet if I had seen Jacob Snyder give that talk, I would understand exactly what was going on and I would not have read that sentence. And what I would say is, Fantastic. You were on your game as a listener, and then Jacob was on his game as a speaker. But that sentence at a conference or in a symposium, that sentence serves as a safety rope for the audience. In case they zone out, they get tired, they receive a text or whatever, that allows them to stay in the presentation. A couple of other things about the sentence headline. Keep it to one or two lines. If it goes more than two lines, our focus groups find that people won't read it. Uh, perhaps it's just too much time away from the speaker. Capitalize it the way you would a sentence. It's just easier for people to read a sentence that's capitalized as a sentence. Also, don't center it. Let justify it. It's an easier read for the audience. And the period, do you need a period? Because it's a standalone sentence, a period isn't required. However, if you hear the voice of your fifth grade teacher to put a period there and it haunts you at night, put the period, it's not that big of a deal. So that's the sentence. What about the visual evidence? With the visual evidence, let's see, the big thing is avoid clutter. In other words, try to have the slide breathe. And I think Jacob Snyder did a really good job here with the positioning of the three contour plots and, and, and not allowing them to crowd the headline. Leave some space there. Very nice. And one last thing is think about how you're going to tell the story of the scene. And so in this case, Jacob Snyder discussed the one contour plot and then animated in the second one when he was ready and when the audience was ready, and then animated in the third, again, when the audience was ready. So we've talked about two of the principles of the assertion evidence approach. Build your talk on messages, not on topics. And support those messages with visual evidence, not bullet list. The third principle of the assertion evidence approach is that when you present that visual evidence, fashion sentences on the spot. In other words, show that you own the information. Now, many of you might be afraid of this particular principle. You think, oh, I don't think I can do it. I need those bullet lists for me to know what to say. And what I would say is, you don't. It is your research. If you choose visual evidence that is from your work, you can present it. You don't need those bullet lists. As a research scientist or a research engineer, be an experimentalist. Try this approach. And in trying this approach, rather than starting with PowerPoint's defaults, Go to our website, www.assertionevidence.com, and download one of our PowerPoint templates. They're free. 
It doesn't cost you anything, but it's going to save you a lot of time. You also find some example presentations by people such as Jacob Snyder and Katie Kirsch, whom I had mentioned earlier. So what we've done here is, is I have shown you a different approach to give a scientific research presentation. And I hope that you'll be an experimentalist and try this approach. In a second film that's coming up, we're going to walk through a research presentation, title slide, mapping slide, the body slides, conclusion slide, to show some best examples on what it is that you can do. Thank you.